that that answer isn't authenticated. It's simply yes or no. Then there's transaction authorization, and this is really the, the core of the protocol. So the terminal sends to the card a description of the transaction, so the amount, the currency, what type it is, the date, and a few other little things, and then the card calculates a MAC over it, a message authentication code, normally triple DES, and then sends that to the terminal. Now the terminal has a choice whether it should go online or not, whether it should contact the bank which issued the card. In the UK, and most other countries, in almost every case, sometimes in every case, it will contact the bank. And in this talk, I'm only talking about online transactions, where the MAC and the transaction is sent to the bank which issued the card. The bank checks this according to the records. It makes sure the keys are correct and the contents are what they expect. They also make sure you have enough money in your account and then send an answer back to the terminal to say whether this should go ahead. And that's, that is authenticated. But clearly they, that isn't working. So what went wrong? Well, if we look at the system in a bit more detail and look at what is actually sent to the card, well, there's the amount, there's the currency, there's the date, there's um, a nonce, it's a random number, um, and then there's a TVR. And the TVR is the thing that contains the terminal's view of how this transaction went, whether anything went wrong, and if something went wrong, what was it? And byte three within here deals with the PIN. And it answers questions like, did the PIN verification fail? And was the PIN required and not entered? Now, if we look at the bit of the spec which actually talks about it, although this is really the core of the protocol, it's only in the Annex C5 in a little table at the back. And there's not very much detail. This is all there is that's available. And the two fields that I'm interested in are there's um, bit five, which is pin entry required and pin pad present or not working. Now, what does this actually mean? What does it mean that pin entry is required? I couldn't find anywhere else in the spec where it clearly said, what does it mean? Does it mean the card requires it? Does it mean the terminal requires it? Does it mean the terminal can do it and thinks it should? So there's a little bit of um, vague details in there. And the case is very similar for bit four. So I probably spent about a day trying to work out what this meant because I was trying to implement a compatible version. But the people who are working for term terminal manufacturers don't have that luxury of time. They can't spend a day deciding whether to set a bit or not. So I thought it was reasonable that if I spent that amount of time doing it, then maybe some terminal manufacturers would get it wrong. And maybe in that case, the banks would not be able to use this TVR to detect whether the pin was entered, in, in, entered correctly. So I think one reasonable explanation for it is um, if the pin is not required, then make the TVR all zeros. Because it's not required, you don't need to set the bit. But on the other hand, if the pin is entered, incorrectly, entered correctly, then the TVR is still zero because it was required, but it was set correctly. So these two cases where one, the pin is not required, and two, the pin is correct, look the same from the bank's perspective. So that means that a man in the middle can change the result of pin verification and the bank won't be able to tell what's going on. And that's exactly what we did. And what this allows criminals to do is to steal a card that they don't know the pin, but still make the bank think that the pin was entered correctly. So how do we actually do this? Well, firstly, we build a bit of hardware for doing the man in the middle attack. And we used an FPGA board for doing the low-level um, electrical interface. And then we used a PC running some Python scripts for doing the software side of things. And we put this all in the backpack, which you saw. But in fact, it's very, very simple. All it's doing is having a malicious card shown in red, which is able to talk to the real card. The first stage of the transaction is card authentication. So here, we relay the messages between the real card and the terminal without modifying them. So the additional signatures still work out fine. The criminal then enters in 0000, or anything. It doesn't really matter what he types in. The terminal will then send that 000 to the man in the middle device, and then it sends back to the terminal the answer yes. It will always answer yes. 
And we never send that pen to the card. We never ask it anything to do with pins. And then transaction authorization continues just as normal. We don't modify any messages coming in. We don't mes modify messages coming out. So that means that the message authentication codes will still be valid. Therefore, when the Mac is sent to the bank for verification, they will come back and they will say yes. They can't tell what's been going on. So to see why they can't spot what's going on, let's have a look again at the actual definition of the transaction. So you've got all the usual things, and here's the TVR. Well, the TVR has got a, a bit that says, did the pin verification fail? Well, the card doesn't think pin verification failed. It just wasn't attempted. And that will happen legitimately. Some terminals don't have pin pads. Some terminals have a pin pad that's broken, and the EMV system was designed to allow it still to continue in those cases. Also, some customers, yeah, also some customers cannot enter in a pin. You can get cards which have a flag that, say it, that, that says, I don't accept pins because maybe this person is disabled and isn't able to properly use a pin pad. So these cards exist. From the terminal's perspective, of course it didn't fail because it got the answer back from what it thinks is a real card, which says that the verification succeeded. Then there's a the question, um, was pin verification, was the pin required and not entered? Well, here, it wasn't, the card doesn't think it's required because of all these cases where it's not, and the terminal doesn't think it's required and not entered because it was entered. So, in all those cases, it's perfectly happy. So we, we told the banks about this. We, we practiced responsible disclosure. We told them about it in November 2009 and offered to help them try to fix the problem, understand the problem, and we heard nothing. Nothing happened whatsoever. Then three months later, um, we spoke to some journalists. It went on the news, and then things started happening. <laughs> yeah. The bank... The bank still didn't talk to us, but they did release a, a press release. Um, this is from the UK Cars Association, who act as spokesman for the banking industry in the UK. So the first thing they said is that when a card company receives a claim about a fraudulent transaction, they will always rely on the primary evidence to review the facts, and they would never use a paper receipt for evidence. Because remember, in this case, the paper receipt will, see, will say the PIN was verified correctly, and supposedly the banks will not rely on that. But it turns out that claim is just simply wrong. Here's a letter, again, from American Express, where you can see that there's a disputed transaction here for a few thousand pounds, and it says that um, we were provided a copy of the till receipts confirming these charges were verified by PIN. And in this particular case, the only evidence that Amex have that this was a PIN verified transaction is these receipts. But these receipts aren't worth the paper they're written on because of this flaw in the protocol. The Cards Association also said that the industry is confident that forensic signature of such an attack is easily detectable within the data available at the time of the transaction. <laughs> so, is this always the case? Well, here's a, another transaction which was being disputed. This was for someone on holiday, and there was a, um, about um, six, eight thousand pounds worth of um, foreign currency taken out from his account. And then they say that these are computerized records, so you can rely on them. And also, um, according to our records, all successful transactions were authorized with a genuine card and the correct personal identification number. Well, fortunately, this customer is able to get a copy of the receipt, the receipt that was generated by the shop in these cases. And here's a copy of it. And it's got these cryptic hexadecimal characters at the bottom. But if we zoom in on byte three in there, um, which is a 08, and going back to that table, that says the pin entry was acquired, the pin pad was present, but the pin was not entered. So the banks don't know. <laughs> so either the banks aren't keeping proper records, or they don't know how to interpret their records to know when the pin was entered in correctly or not. And finally, they said that neither the banking industry nor the police have any evidence of criminals having the capability to deploy such sophisticated attacks. 
Our research suggests that criminal interest in ship-based attacks is minimal at the time, as they are unable to find ways to make sufficient amounts of money from any of the plausible attack scenarios. Yeah. So this is essentially, criminals are stupid. So one of the objections to our attack is that criminals wouldn't be able to do this because they'd have to carry a backpack into a shop and somehow shops don't like that. Um, so they said that in order for criminals to do that, they would need to shrink it. And this is far too sophisticated for them because criminals can't make miniature electronics, um, but then there's skimmers and all those things that um, have mobile phones and, and all sorts of very clever things that they're perfectly capable of doing. Um, so one of our, our master's students, um, Omar Chowdhury, um, looked at how difficult it was to build one of these things. And that's what he came up with. So <laughs> this is um, about the same size as a pack of cards. And um, it's got a battery, it's got a, a screen and a card reader and a fake card coming off the, the other side. Um, the, reason, the main reason he built this was not to develop a device that was designed for use in fraud, but to help prevent it. So what this does is if you use it in a transaction, it will tell you what the card is really seeing because criminals have compromised chip and pin terminals and that would allow them to commit a type of fraud where you think you're paying one amount of money because that's what's being displayed on the screen, but the card is authorizing vastly larger sum of money. So with this device, um, it, it was able to keep a log of the transactions, so you've got evidence if you're going to get in a dispute, and it's got a screen, so it, it will show you the transaction. And it's got a few buttons, and you can say, do you authorize this or not? And uh, we've tried some demos with that. But in addition, because it sits between a card and a terminal, it's able to write a little bit of extra software for carrying out this attack. Um, it's based around a, an AVR8 microcontroller, um, so it's quite easy to, to work with. And I can show you a video of this where it was demonstrated on French TV. Bancaire, dont il ne connaît pas les codes. Ok, je pense à là. Sans code, il ne peut théoriquement pas s'en servir. Il faut d'abord introduire la carte ici. Ensuite, vous allumez l'appareil. Et voilà, nous sommes prêts pour la transaction. Direction un centre commercial de Cambridge. Dans un grand magasin multimédia, Omar s'amuse à faire son shopping. J'ai pris Avatar, je crois que c'est pas mal. Et Ninja Assassin. Je ne sais pas ce que c'est, mais j'adore la jaquette. Bon, maintenant, autour des livres. Harry Potter pour ma femme. Ça fait combien en tout Environ 50 livres. Vous pensez que ça va marcher Vous verrez bien. Puis c'est le passage en caisse. Omar va utiliser le piège à carte bleue, dissimulé sous sa manche. « 57 livres 98, s'il vous plaît. » Le chercheur paye. Le caissier ne remarque rien d'anormal. « Je rentre n'importe quel code. »« 4 x 0, ce n'est pas le bon code. »« Et pourtant... »« C'est bon ?»« Oui, c'est bon. »« C'est bon. Oh, » So that demonstration was done in October 2010, which is almost a year since the representatives of the French banking industry said that this attack doesn't work on French cards. <laughs> so that brings us into December 2010. Um, so this is now over a year since the banks were first notified. And now, for some reason, the UK Cars Association tried a little bit of a different tack. They tried to remove the documents from the web. The, <laughs> this is a, a section from their letter. It's all available online if you want to read the full thing. Um, they said that it is the publication of this level of detail which we believe breaches the boundary of responsible disclosure. <laughs> Essentially, it places in the public domain a blueprint for building a device which purports to exploit a loophole in the security of chip and pin. Consequently, we would ask that this research be removed from public access immediately and hope that you can give us some comfort about your policy towards future disclosures. <laughs> so 
So it's hard to know where to start when ex in explaining how 